Dr. Seekers obtained his undergraduate degree in zoology at Wheaton College in Illinois. He went on to obtain his MD at UT Southwestern Medical School in 1968. Les completed his psychoanalytic training at New Orleans Psychoanalytic Institute in New Orleans, his internship at Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas, and residency at UT Southwestern Medical School. He joined the UT Southwestern faculty in 1974 and at present is president of the TMA Foundation. Les? It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Kim, who's going to introduce our speaker. Dr. Tom Kim lives and works in Austin, where he serves as Chief Medical Officer of med to you offering comprehensive health care solutions. Physician evangelist for Medi, mobile app platform redefining the provider-patient relationship, and principal for AGMP Telehealth offering clinical and consulting telehealth services. Dr. Kim has devoted his professional life to realizing a value-based approach to healthcare through telehealth. His experiences include caring for a wide range of clinical populations who share trauma as a primary clinical challenge, including natural disasters, military service, incarceration, abuse, and neglect. Dr. Kim received his BA in philosophy from Georgetown University and MD and MPH from Tulane University. He continued at Tulane with a combined residency in internal medicine and psychiatry and a general medical medicine fellowship in health services research. Dr. Kim. Well, he's coming up. This is an important presentation. I had a comment from a physician yesterday evening who said, this, what you're going to hear today, has had the most significant change in my practice of any one thing that I've ever encountered. So I encourage you to listen to this and think about all that's coming forward. Thank you, Dr. Sechrist. I will uncharacteristically be brief. Um, please allow me to uh, introduce you Dr. Giordino. He is Professor of Pediatrics and the Section Chief of Academic General Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, uh, who received his medical degree and, doc and doctorate in education from the University of Pennsylvania, followed by residency and uh, fellowship at uh, CHOP. He currently serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Quality Officer at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston and is the Distinguished Fellow at the American uh, College of Medical Quality uh, with boards in um, child abuse pediatrics by the ABP and has published several textbooks and articles to that effect. It is my great privilege to introduce you uh, to Dr. Giardino, and uh, hopefully we'll have a robust discussion following his presentation uh, around ACEs. Good morning. I'm really delighted to uh, be invited to speak to you about adversity and resilience. Uh, we have a number of learning objectives. <clears throat> And they were really focused on looking at the social determinants of health, how that relates to adversity, and then how can we practically impact that. So this is, we'll, we'll go through a lot of frameworks. And what I'm seeking to do is present a scaffolding for then some discussion. So the way we've talked about this is I'm going to give you some content, and then there's microphones around the room, and then we're going to have a fair amount of time for you as uh, the practicing physicians to kind of interact with us. So the first framework, and all of you have seen this, but it's the IHI's uh, uh, triple aim uh, diagram. And as the top of the triangle is population health, we're all trying to make things better. At the one corner is the experience of care. We want the, the patients and the families to really experience that we care about them and that they're engaged with their own care. And then, of course, we want to achieve value. We want to do high-quality care for the lowest cost, and that's value. But what people don't always talk about is that dot in the middle that dot in the middle is the integrator. There needs to be someone who pulls all that together. And I would propose to you the integrator is typically the physician. 
and sometimes the physician and the organization that they work for. But you need that integrator but because to improve quality, to improve the experience, and to do it for a reasonable cost, you need someone who knows what they're doing. And I think the practicing physician is that person in that dot. The next model that we'll use is the chronic care model, and this comes from uh, uh, a really prominent uh, physician, Ed Wagner, in Seattle. And in that top bubble there, in that oval, is the healthcare system. That's all of the resources that we use to try to deliver care. And then the healthcare system is supposed to work together to activate the patient and to essentially prepare the provider and the provider's team to interact productively with that activated patient. And then that, act, that, that, that activated patient and the prepared team interact and they produce great care. That's really informative to us because some of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about really relates to how you activate the patient because you recognize their experiences and now they know that you as the provider know what they've gone through and then, of course, you're prepared as the provider to do a great job with them. And then this is the social determinant of health framework. And uh, essentially what this is trying to show is if you look at the health factors that lead to the top five preventable diseases, heart disease, cancer, stroke, lung disease, and diabetes in our adult population, and then look at the outcomes, when you look at that, there's a number of things that um, really affect those conditions and then the ultimate outcome, both in terms of mortality and morbidity. And if you go through that uh, middle column there, you see that social factors from the research in terms of the epidemiology are really uh, account for about 40% of how that patient's gonna do. Right above the social factors, you see the clinical care and people quibble about the percentage, but clinical care accounts for about 20% of how they'll do. Essentially, that direct interaction that we have, some of the things we do certainly impacts their care, but frankly, how the patient comes to us in terms of their education, the type of employment, the support that they have from their family, and then those health behaviors, if they smoke, if they eat the right foods, if they're physically active, if they overuse alcohol and substances, those all come together and then create the mortality and morbidity. So we have to kind of think much more broadly than just which statin we're using. We have to kind of think about how the patient comes to us, what their experiences are, what support they would get to make good choices. Okay, so what are the ACEs? And I'm a pediatrician by training, so of course, I'm very interested in things that have the word childhood in them, uh, but I will broaden this so that you can see the connection between pediatric physicians and adult serving physicians. But the adverse childhood experiences essentially have been defined as this set of uh, adversity. So on the one side are uh, abuse, so physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse, and then neglect, physical and emotional neglect, and then household dysfunctions. And you can see uh, what some of those are, but mental health issues, uh, having someone in the family that's incarcerated, uh, having domestic violence present in the family, having substance abusers in the family, and having a broken uh, marriage. Now, Interestingly enough, in 1998, this wonderful landmark study came out of the CDC and, the, and Kaiser in California. And essentially, Dr. Felitti, who worked in the San Diego Kaiser Permanente system, just could not get over that he would give great advice to his patients, and they never took it in terms of making lifestyle changes. And he said, there must be something going on. And he was talking to Dr. Anda at CDC, and they said, let's do a survey. So they got 17,000 patients who were seen in Kaiser. So they have great medical records in Kaiser, even in 1998. So they knew what the physical health was of these middle-aged patients, and they were in their late 40s and early 50s. So they had medical records for 17,000 patients. They sent them a survey, and they asked them about their childhoods, okay? And if you've done any reading, you know that surveys usually get a very, very low response rate. This res the, the response rate to this survey was above 75%. And that tells you that people had a story to tell. And when they answered the surveys, they were an answering questions about what they were exposed to as a child. And you can see that a significant number of them 
had some type of adversity, those adverse childhood experiences that I, that I talked to you about. And if you kind of look at the slide here, you can see the most common household, uh, most common adverse childhood experience was living in a home where someone had a substance abuse problem. Another common adversity was being treated in a way where you were physically harmed. Uh, and then they kind of go from there. But if you look at that pie diagram, about 30% of people had wonderful childhoods. They had no adversity whatsoever. But then as you go around the pie chart, you start to see that um, uh, a certain percentage had one ace, a certain percentage had two aces. And surprisingly, about 11 or 12% of folks had four or more aces. So think about a childhood where you have four of these adversities and what that kind of childhood would be like. So they got that survey, and then they had, um, they had the ability to see how many ACEs there were, and then they had the medical records. So remember, I told you, these are 40 or 50-year-olds, and we asked them questions about their childhoods, and now we had their medical records. So we could see if they had obesity, if they had diabetes, if they had COPD, if they had heart disease. So they were able to do the statistics to do correlation. So now this is correlational work. This is 1998. But there was a way of saying, if you had this adversity, what's the correlation to having this when you were an adult? If you had two adversities, what's the correlation if you had three? And there was this staircase um, impact, and, and the, the break point was at four. So if you had four or more ACEs, you were two times more likely to have ischemic heart disease. You were nearly two times as likely to have cancer. You were over two times more likely to have a stroke, and on and on. So there was this incredible connection between having a tough childhood and having poor adult health. And that was revolutionary. In 1998, I remember when this came out, and I was like, wow, finally, finally what kind of clinically made sense is now supported by some statistics. So I'll go into that a little bit more. There's more data there. And these slides are available to you. I had asked the TMA to make them available to you. So if you would like this slide deck, I would encourage you to talk to the TMA folks, find out how to get it. And please feel free to use these if you're talking to community groups. Um, but the bottom line is that persons who had four or more ACEs compared to those who did not had a four to 12-fold increase in health risk for alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and suicidality. Two to four-fold increase in uh, smoking, poor self-rated health, having uh, a high number of sexual partners and STDs, and a 1.6 to 1.4 to 1.6-fold increase in physical inactivity and severe obesity. And there's this graded relationship. It's a staircase relationship. So we'll talk a little bit about why that's now important. And surprisingly, if you had more than six aces, now think about that, what an awful childhood you must have had if you had six aces, on average, you live for 20 years less. So if you had six aces, you were more likely to die by 60. The people who didn't have aces lived to 80. So that's stunning. So somehow an experience leads to poorer adult health. So of course there was a lot of thought about that. And I just threw this in there to just show children who are, who are abused, because uh, I'm a pediatrician, I look at this. There's a lifetime cost for the nation of $124 billion. So if you think about, if you have the number of children that are being abused right now, it cost our country $124 billion over their lifetimes because of lost productivity, because of poorer health, and the ACEs is explaining the poorer health, because some of those kids need special education, they need child welfare services, and then there's some involvement with the criminal justice system. Okay, so, the critical concept here is that uh, childhood adversity has lifelong consequences. So of course we tried to figure out why would that be? Why would having a tough childhood lead to poor adult health? So this was the original pyramid. So you can see at the bottom, adverse childhood experiences that must lead to some kind of social, emotional, cognitive impairment, but there's a scientific gap there. See the arrow? That was a theory, but they didn't know what that was. And then that leads to adopting poorer health behaviors, which then leads to poorer health and then earlier mortality. But see those arrows on the right-hand side? There were scientific gaps. This was from 1998. Well, they figured it out. 
So, you know, it's 1998, it's, you know, two decades later, right? So you have adverse childhood experiences, and those experiences lead to disrupted neurodevelopment. There's something about being exposed to adverse childhood experiences that creates a hormonal set, you know, essentially you can imagine probably experiencing more stress, right, having more cortisol. There's something that leads to kind of a hormonal set where your actual brain architecture changes. The number of connections between neurons changes. The way that certain genes are expressed changes. And that's where that term epigenetics comes from. So obviously we're all born with, you know, our genetic endowment. And then that genetic endowment has to manifest itself. So epigenetics is the science of how, how does it that your genes get expressed? What gets promoted? What gets suppressed? Well, at being exposed to adversity in your childhood and being exposed to four or more adverse childhood experiences really impacts the epigenetics. It really affects what gets expressed and what doesn't. And it affects essentially your neurodevelopment and essentially your brain architecture. So, like any good theory, right, it always gets developed. So I showed you the ACEs, and then people said, that can't possibly be the only list of adversity. So then people came with other lists. So that's the original list. And then there's ACEs plus. Um, living in an environment where your property gets vandalized all the time, living in an environment where you're bullied, living in an environment where there's a lot of community violence. So there's other adversities. And then in the inner city, there's been some work where there's other adversities that those folks might be exposed to. So the point here is that there's a lot of things that can make you have a tough childhood. So, um, and those, it's not just that original list. Okay, so childhood adversity, poor adult outcomes. I think I've showed you that there's some kind of relationship there. And then there's this black box. What's in that black box? Uh, what is it that does that? So I, there's something about neurodevelopment, there's something about being exposed to these diversities that affect your epigenetics. So I have some really good colleagues who've shared these slides with me, and the answer is in. It's something called toxic stress. When you live as a child in an unpredictable, rough environment where the people that need to take care of you are not taking care of you, or you're experiencing a caregiving system that's unpredictable and not as caring or as safe or as stable or as nurturing, it doesn't buffer your physiology. It doesn't buffer your system. And you experience this thing called toxic stress, which is kind of a severe, unrelenting unpredictability that then changes your hormonal set. You have a lot of stress in your life, and then we all know about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that, that kind of level of essentially being bathed in cortisol affects that brain architecture that I was talking to you about. So that was the epigenetics. So this model of toxic stress, I just want to take one second. So that's on the right-hand side. That's the sustained intent. So again, if you're being exposed to four ACEs on a daily basis, you can imagine that's probably a pretty um, unsupportive, unpredictable environment. Now there's other forms of stress. There's tolerable, tolerable stress. That's a short-lived, it's less intense, but there are some support people around you. You're vulnerable if you're in that realm. And, and you might imagine that if you're in a kind of environment where there are some supportive people, you might be experiencing tolerable stress. And then there's positive stress. Quite frankly, you have to have some stress. All of us have had stress. That's why we succeed it. So, uh, like, positive stress is like you're in the third grade and you have to do your solar system project. And you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But then you have a parent that comes up alongside of you and says, well, let's look into it. Let's kind of do some drawings, maybe do a little Google searching. And then you kind of see that life happens and you get over it. That's good. There's, so there's, there's positive aspects to stress. The problem with toxic stress is that, frankly, it's unrelenting and it creates this unpredictability that it, it, it would appear that human infants are very sensitive to, and certainly toddlers are as well.
So the, the, the trick here is to come up with a way of getting more social emotional buffering so that we can move the toxic stress over to tolerable and positive. So of course you can imagine how at a family level, okay, so maybe the parents are having problems, but if the, if the grandparents can show up and help, that's wonderful. If the siblings can show up, that's wonderful. If there's community groups that can provide uh, help. If church groups kind of take kids under their wings and make sure that they know that there's some adults that really care about them. That's kind of how you buffer that toxic stress. Okay, so again, I told you that that black box really appears to be the toxic stress. And what happens when you get toxic stress, and now this is now getting into neuroscience, and I'm a general pediatrician, so I'll just give you my two little, uh, my two cent version of this. So the toxic stress creates this milieu physiologically where uh, your brain architecture is changing a little bit, your kind of neural system is kind of changing. And what that positions you for is kind of behavioral choices where you do this thing, it's a really cool word, behavior allostasis. So essentially you try to do things that dial down the stress. And regretfully, you know, the obvious example would be if you're a teenager and you're feeling really stressed, you might be interested in using substances which seem to dial that down. If you're um, <clears throat> an adult and uh, you're always feeling out of control, you might want to get into relationships where you start to feel more powerful because that helps you dial down that stress. So, so what, what we end up doing as humans is that that scientific gap that I was sharing about, what we tend to do is we start adopting behaviors that seem to, um, on the surface, reduce that feeling of powerlessness, of unpredictability. Of course, we know that it's long term that's not helpful or positive and that the substances or the bad choices don't lead to great things, but in the moment they do. So this behavioral allostasis tends to be kind of how that epigenetic stuff expresses itself. So there's just some models. I want to get through because I want to get to the questions. So the preeminent priority of this is prevention, okay? So we want to really protect brain development. We want to dial down the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And we want to have this social emotional buffering present in the childhoods of a lot of children. And more and more children need more and more buffering. So we want to really think about how to promote these safe, stable, nurturing environments so that children, regardless of kind of the family they're built into, can, built, born into, can kind of have some positive parenting experiences, some attachment to adults that care about them. So that's the prevention. And that kind of leads us now to the uh, population health aspect of this. And the population health aspect essentially try to, tries to look at those interventions at the bottom, and we kind of move from dealing with factors that might be out there that maybe we can start mitigating. Then we want to look at some of the individual features that we could kind of work on, and that might involve some of you, because you, you do face-to-face -face care during an interaction, you're uh, forming a relationship with a patient, and then you start going upstream a little bit in terms of uh, thinking about community resources and things uh, that would try to improve the quality of life for the whole community. So our model in, health, in, in the world, really, in terms of uh, wellness promotion, tends to be kind of on these axes. So you go from individual to collective on the um, vertical, and then you go from reactive to preventive on the horizontal. So most of our healthcare tends to be individual and reactive, right? Uh, and obviously to do some of the stuff I'm talking about where we make sure that there's a kind of a culture of social emotional buffering where we start to create expectations that we have safe, stable, nurturing uh, environments for kids to grow up in is more on the preventive collective. And then just to give you some examples. So the individual reactive would be crisis work, therapy medications, sy system containment. Uh, at the collective level, the reactive for, for folks who are really kind of struggling is to have food banks, shelters, uh, places for the homeless folks to go. And then the preventive individual would be skill building, emotional literacy, fitness, personal improvement plans, uh, empowering kids to resist uh, thinking about uh, drugs and alcohol. And then at the preventive collective would be community development, making sure that people have access to good housing, recreational opportunity. If everybody had a good school to go to, there would be really 
great childhood, likely. Uh, if we had great services that everybody had access to, we could find these problems early. So this is a pipe dream, but it's good to have a framework. Uh, this is just, just to show, you know, that's what we tend to target in terms of uh, this. But I, the reason why I show this is I want to make sure that you know the ACEs are things where if you're aware of as a physician, you can come up alongside of the person and recognize some of the issues that they've been exposed to, but you're not gonna be the one that can fix it. This isn't one more thing that now is put on your list. Uh, this is something that if you're aware of, you can partner with a patient, you can help activate them in that chronic care model because you're prepared and you can help activate them. But a lot of the, a lot of the interventions to help us use what we understand now about the adverse childhood experiences, about resilience, about adversity, it's gonna be beyond the four walls of the doctor's office. It's gonna be referring families, uh, patients and families to community resources, to behavioral health services, to wellness coaches, taking advantage of those kind of opportunities. So it's something where you're gonna kind of be more of a coach and an encourager, but it's not something that now, okay, now, you know, in addition to dealing with diabetes and COPD, now I have to, you know, put hours aside a day to deal with ACEs. It's more an awareness on your part so that you can recognize that the person who kind of keeps overeating, it's not because they're a bad person. It's because there's reasons why they're in that situation where food is somewhat of an obsession for them. And by recognizing that, it's somewhat liberating. And that's certainly what Dr. Felitti found. When he started using this work, it was kind of like the scales came down from everybody's eyes. And it's not like the person wanted to be devious. It's not like they wanted to be non-compliant. But there's just factors in their life that the, the kind of supports they had in their life just didn't help them make great decisions. So now you start talking about, well, how do you start getting into a world where you start making great decisions? Well, maybe it would help like if you didn't stop for a drink every night after work. You know, maybe if you weren't sitting at the bar, you wouldn't be kind of in, with the support system of people that are doing that. You know, so, you know, depending on your community and your faith system, you might say, instead of going to the bar, maybe, you know, try the, the Bible study. You know, you might meet some folks who aren't going to suggest they have a drink. Um, so those are the kind of things where this leads to. And this is just trying to show you most of the money goes to treatment, but we're talking about thinking more about prevention and wellness. And then just to put a finer point on the economics, there's this guy named Heckman. He won a Nobel Prize, and um, he's done really great work. And what he's shown through a lot of detailed analysis is, as a society, the more we make our programming investments up towards the younger ages, the return on investment is tremendous. It's like for every dollar you invest, you get five dollars back. But if you kind of wait and do interventions at a societal level later, so like, you know, post-school, uh, let's take, for example, the example he uses is someone who is on their third uh, halfway house after being incarcerated five times. The likelihood that those dollars are going to return much are, is low. Whereas if we really think as a society doing things earlier, it's gonna be much more productive. And then I'm gonna probably stop soon because we really wanted to have some questions. And uh, I just wanted to kind of just give you that scaffolding. So I'm gonna close on this one. There was, this book came out a couple years ago and I don't know if anyone's read it, but uh, uh, Paul Tuff is a, a journalist. And he, wa he was interested in how do children succeed? And he was responding to, uh, uh, you know, uh, these questions about what is it that makes kids successful. And, and he, he discovered the ACEs, and he interviewed some people from the book. And he came up with this concept called grit. It's important for kids not to lead a completely stress-free life. Because we want kids who want to produce and perform and achieve. Um, so it's really good for kids to have that third grade solar science project, like the solar system project. Like they need to kind of know that they have to work hard to get things done. But what he found was the thing that really, really, really predicted if a kid was successful is if they were surrounded by adults who helped them through that stressful situation and got them to the other side, who could reassure them that it could work out. 
And that having projects, essentially, that made you stressful, but having adults that help you walk through it is really how kids learn how to have grit. Like they could kind of just stick to it and get through. So I think that's really instructive in terms of what we need to do as a community now, in terms of making sure that if the kid is in a stressful situation or is being exposed to adversity, that we have options for them. But for the patients that you're probably taking care of who are adults, uh, we, we have to not give them this fatalistic thing like, oh, you had four aces, you're done. You can overcome that. You can overcome that. Because if you can recognize that the experiences that you had as a child have kind of positioned you for some neurodevelopmental changes where you tend to make some bad choices, particularly around health-related things like eating, substance abuse, being in violent relationships, you, you know, that kind of stuff. If you can help them recognize that it's not their fault and they're just responding to things, but they can learn how to respond differently. They just have to invest in figuring out what their responses are now and how to get better or how to make better choices, that's empowering. And that's back to that chronic care model. You're activating the patient and you're prepared to tell them the right thing. It really does come down to them making better choices and they have to start thinking about their support systems and how they can develop support systems that will help them make those choices. So I think this can be a really, really empowering message and it's a way of looking at your non-compliant adult patients and rather than being angry and frustrated at them, understanding they're struggling and with you as a physician recognizing that they can overcome that and that we understand kind of that background and all this ACE stuff, it's an empowering message and you can help them kind of get to that next level. So with that, I think I'd like to open it up to the questions. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Giordino. Could I ask everyone, let's all take a deep breath. It is not often that we encounter something that has such a significant ripple effect through our profession. I was a little bit surprised and stunned when I was initially asked to help out with this program, in part because I'm an adult trained person and in part because I mostly deal in technology. And in working with the group, discovered that having a trauma-informed lens, and that's the construct that I'm going to invite you to look at, that ACEs represents a lens that we can hold up in looking at our patients that has so many positive and sometimes negative consequences that, that any healthcare provider, and I'm not just talking about doctors, can benefit from both personally and in through the delivery of their care. And if you think that this doesn't affect you in some way, shape, or form, either personally or professionally, you know, I'm reminded a couple of weeks ago where I turned the TV on and I saw thousands, thousands of Texans, including children, just with, you know, indescribable sense of loss and just powerlessness, and I had to turn off the UT season opener. But I understand that, you know, adverse events is something that touches us all. And so with that, I invite you to come up and ask the hard question. Find the proper form of the question in why does this matter to me? Or how can I actually meaningfully engage our patients? And we have some extraordinary voices here, um, and hopefully we'll have a, a dynamic conversation. Dr. Turk. Thank you very much for uh, bringing this topic to this broader um, audience. Uh, we've been, it's been bubbling, as you mentioned, uh, in the pediatric community for a number of years, and gi giving it uh, some, some exposure uh, to all facets of the medical community is so important because it transcends uh, the, the patients that we take care of in childhood, and be they become the patients of our colleagues who are suffering from chronic diseases. I'm, I'm troubled uh, that our culture is not one that tends to support the execution of solutions to, the, to this very real problem because we tend to celebrate the uh, responsibility of the individual and, and what, they, what, they are, what they do and what they say is what they're responsible for and we tend to throw up our eyes and our hands when they say, well, it was my mother's being abused and, and, and the fact that we went through these horrible times, and, well, you know, I had tr trouble times too and look where I am. You know, we, we're not sympathetic to these messages, but the data is clear, and, and we must understand that while prevention is never sexy, it sure is a lot less costly to prevent these issues now um, with, with, with the most vulnerable of, our, of, our, of, of the human population. 
uh, than to try and treat them later. So thank you very much for, for the talk. Thank you. Uh, microphone one. Hello. I'm kind of short. Okay. Um, I'm, I, had a, I had a question. I practice at Body of Christ Community Clinic, and I see the end results of people who have not had it. And we are a 14 church-supported group. We don't take any federal monies. We only see patients on Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons. And on Tuesday mornings, um, we are cheaper, I found out, than People's Community Clinic in Austin. And we, we coordinate with Baylor Scott and White. Question number one. Now that we have this person who's at the end stage, are there any secondary prevention that I can do to prevent further trauma? Or how can, that's one. So again, my understanding is your, your question is, in the practice setting that you have, where, where you're working with people who have really right. experienced these ACEs. Well, they, they have their ACEs. Right. I mean, they are, they are the alcoholic. Right. And when I screen them, they have the ACEs. Right. Uh, and I actually count them. I didn't know that existed, so I appreciate your talk, but I actually sit there and count them. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, they have already been incarcerated maybe once. I know that they are choosing to go ahead and do a second chance. Right. And since we are a community church outreach of communal churches in the Belton Temple area, we are there to, as, our, as a ministry, to be there to give right. them that second chance. Okay. So, so again, it, um, the ACEs are, are not fatalistic, so it's not that they can't overcome. Do you have any, exactly. So do you have any suggestions of how to overcome? Right, well, and again, I think that now depends on what those specific issues are for that specific patient. But well, a, a trauma-informed approach first, you know, essentially starts moving away from uh, talking to them about, you know, kind of blaming them for their problem. And most of the, of the interventions for adults would be something akin, and, and people know a little bit more about this than I do, would be something really related to either mindfulness or cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and the reason why I mention those two approaches is that both cognitive behavioral therapy and really the, the folks that do mindfulness training get to this as well, is what is it that, um, how do you respond to things? What triggers you? Okay. And then how can you learn different ways of responding to that? And uh, by, by, by kind of approaching it that way, you really get the patient to a professional who has a lot of experience at growing awareness because ultimately what the person who's been exposed to a lot of ACEs needs to do is they, they essentially need to grow an awareness about what their ACEs were and what happened and then they have to get comfortable with the fact that they're going to move past their aces. Okay, so they were in a tough family and they didn't get a great, let's say, parenting. They have to eventually get to the point that they can move past that. And I think the most effective programs that I've seen are things that relate to cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness. And it sounds like you're in a faith-oriented system. So, so I will, yes. So we do not have the money or the resources that give them to mindfulness. We are trying to ex activate the patient in the mindfulness and kind of behavioral therapy through faith-based options. However, the feedback I'm receiving from this recalcitrant troop group is that they kind of glom to me, the internist. They're not comfortable being in a group-like setting, and we tend to use digital. And I was using, I was trying to give them mind, free mindfulness things from the UCLA mark. And so I was also curious to see, is there any digital um, platforms that I could say, okay, I can't, I, I, they don't feel comfortable talking to them because they've been abused so much, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't trust, they don't trust people. And when they finally get someone they trust, they really glom into you because they've been rejected so much. So then the question is that can we, we definitely have to, so I will activate the churches and tell them they have to have a friend to go with them. But they feel more comfortable with digital media at this moment to do that transition. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's the mo like the movie Her. I didn't get to see that. I never had the time to watch the movie Her. But, it, it, but they seem to be more comfortable with their phones. And is there any technology-wise, because everyone seems to have a phone on them. 
I think that's a Texas standard that all people must uh, have a, a cell phone granted to them. Is there any digital media besides the UCLA MARC system where they could maybe have those questions asked to them in a non-judgmental form so they can do mindfulness or, or things like that? So I heard the word digital, so I'm happy to field that one uh, for those who know me. Um, I am here by accident, as I mentioned. Uh, I, I've been out of practice for about 12 years taking care of vulnerable populations, all of whom top well over six aces, uh, and this was unplanned. My sort of skill mastery with trauma-informed care was largely because I was looking for the sickest people I could to take care of with telehealth. And what's the promise of telehealth, one of the many promises of telehealth, speaks to the idea that when you speak of secondary prevention and taking care of this incredibly vulnerable population, it's not a one and done. It's not an even an eight and done. And despite the fact that most people's health benefit gives them eight or 12 sessions a year, uh, it, it, it can't be wrapped up in a bow. One of my favorite clinical stories was an incarcerated girl who cursed me out once a week for six months. Every day she came in, looked me in the eye, threw a camera, said F you, and walked out. My whole treatment team was going bonkers. There was so much counter-transference. They're like, oh, oh my gosh, gosh darn this person, she's driving me bonkers. And, and my only comment was, I think we're making great progress. <laughs> and what I meant by that was, don't you find it interesting that this incredibly abrasive, not so polite young lady was walking across campus to look me in the eye, to curse me out every day, or excuse me, every week. It is a fundamental part of our sort of uh, professional charge to earn the trust of our patients and establish a therapeutic relationship. And our system and our world is way too complex and chaotic to actually make good on that promise. Technology allows us to redefine the way that we engage it, and we're going to need help. And so you're exactly right. I, I do think that technology offers a way to create teams, to create innovative models of care, to create touches over the long term because most doctors don't have time to get cursed out every week, right? Um, if you do, God bless you, and if you need help, you know, give me a holler. But, but uh, I, I strongly encourage you to, again, take the information that you learned today as a lens, and in talking to your patients, recognize when you're making shame-based comments, like you really should be taking that medicine, or what's happening now, you know, how come you're not taking this or doing what I told you last time? Is there a problem? These subtleties only serve to delay the trust that's absolutely necessary before they can then make the resilient, the, the sort of the gritty decision to, to stand up and be their best person. And, and we need people like pediatricians and psychiatrists, certainly on the front line, but every doctor is going to be touched by this. Just think about every patient that drives you bonkers and you want to you know, beat your head against the wall. There is an opportunity there for you to be the one. And I'm reminded of uh, my time at Hopkins where the starfish story, where that guy was throwing all the starfish back there and it mattered to that one, right? Even though there were thousands of starfish there. The entire intern class at Hopkins Medicine all wear starfish pins because there is way too much work and way too much things to do. But if it matters to that one, I think that we've done our job. The, and the only other thing, just at a detailed level, um, at, the, at the end of the slides, there's two websites that you might want to consider starting to look at. One is called ACES Connect. That's for professionals, so you have to send them an email and then they have to approve you joining. And the other one is called ACES Too High. And uh, that's like a clearinghouse. So the person who was asking about digital resources, that clearinghouse might be a good one to put that question out. Like, are there any digital solutions that are easily accessible for my patients? And if there's somebody in the ACEs too high listserv, they'll write back and they'll give you some ideas. Uh, microphone two. I'm a pediatrician, but I'm trying to look at this from the aspect of adult physicians. Um, so I have two two questions. One, if a mother has significant toxic stress during her pregnancy, how does that affect the fetus? And the second question is, the uh, patients who come in that have uh, problems with substance use and abuse, uh, they perceive or they know that those substances make them feel better and are a solution to their uncomfortable feelings. We perceive it, of course, as a problem. Um, should we restructure our paradigm with how we deal 
with substance use and abuse? That's a fantastic question. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll take two cracks at that and then my colleagues can. So I think the, the jury is not in in terms of if the, if the mom is experiencing toxic stress, how that affects the, the fetus just yet. Where that does get connected, though, is that th these kind of adversities tend to be two-generation problems. So likely, if that mom is in that kind of experience, the baby quickly is going to be in that environment as well. So one of my favorite programs is the Nurse Family Partnership, which is a program where you pair a, a young first-time mother with a nurse, and the, that mom gets a essentially two years of visits in their home by this nurse. And, and that program has been subjected to three randomized clinical trials and it's been fabulously successful for both the mother and the baby. It changes the mother's life course. She tends to pick less violent partners. She tends to get, uh, get some job training so she gets a better job. She makes better health choices. Uh, she tends to space out the next pregnancy, so it changes her life course, so we fix that generation, and then she learns how to be a better mother, and she provides, on average, a more safe and stable and nurturing environment. So I don't know physiologically if they transmit it through the placenta, but I guarantee you that social situation, if not addressed, will affect both of them. And then in terms of the second question, just remind me what the second question was. It's going out of my mind. It has as well for me. So it, I think it was largely about whether the, um, the activation of, the, um, of your hormone cascade, you know, what the implications are in sort of a micro level. And, and the answer that no. I heard was at part the answer. I, I think I remember. So, so it was about doing something the differently with substance abuse. The substance, oh, right. Should substance. we re rethink our approach to substance abuse. Right, so, so one of the things uh, is that we actually have to make sure that there are service providers and benefits for substance abuse training, so, so one, uh, for uh, treatment. So one of the, I think the real tragedies in our community is that it's really hard to find really good services to refer folks to. And, and that's not even dealing with the stigma attached to that, just ha actually having good service providers and then having a benefit that's robust enough to cover that. But I'll turn to you. Before I answer that question, I want to point out that Jane is probably the reason why we're here today. Jane Ryder is on the Behavioral Health Task Force, and when we were looking for things to undertake, she says, you need to take a look at ACEs. Right behind her, then a few days later, came David Lakey, who said, you need to take a look at ACEs. And so we're taking a look at ACEs. So to respond to Jane's question, it plays off of what was just said. There's an interesting study that was done in South Dakota on one of the Indian reservations. And those are places where you have the highest degree of alcohol use and death probably in the world. What they did was take adolescent first-time mothers and put them with a more experienced mother. Then they looked at the infant of that first-time mother at two years compared to infants that did not have that sort of an exposure. There is a huge difference in the behavior of the two-year-old with the intervention of just putting a mentor together with that first-time mother. One of my favorite places at uh, medical school to go is uh, each Tuesday, the neuroscience department brings a basic science bench researcher to talk. That's my most favorite place in the world to go. This last week, there was a researcher who presented his work that fits into this tremendously. What he is researching was looking at firing rates in neurons and how that firing rate will determine what genes are activated. And you can do this over and over and over again. And so what you begin to see in basic science is beginning to understand why is it what we see is doing because you begin to see this firing rate. We begin to hear that earlier. You've got the setup that sets in motion 
the genes that you've got. And we all got different genes. And this is why I think you see a person who has that first drink at 12 or 15 and says, this is the thing that I've been looking for all my life. It changes something. It changes the genetic expression. And so what I think we're seeing is some things that are really quite unique. I think the other sort of thing, we look at the ACEs and say, oh, I don't want to get in this. That's too long a conversation. I think what most primary physicians have found, if they ask just one question, I see you responded positively to this ACEs. Tell me how that's affected your life. That's not a 30-minute conversation. It's probably about five minutes. And it's significant. It begins to introduce that we can talk about it. And I think the example of the patient who comes in and says, fuck you, once a week, that was important. They came back over and over again to say, here's a trusted individual. I can come and tell you what I think of you every week, and you didn't go away. This is some of the basic sorts of things that I think is most critical in terms of making people have a different outcome in their health care. So thank you, Jane, for bringing this forward. Here, here. Microphone three. Yes, uh, Glenn Bickey from Houston. Um, Houston's been called the most multi-ethnic city in the country, and we are a nation of immigrants. In that process of becoming American and the stress coming from overseas, stranger in a strange land, uh, the issues of assimilation sometimes cut both ways, and particularly Native American groups have been fighting against assimilationism, and some ethnic groups in America fight against assimilationism as a betrayal to their heritage. Um, and, and that may impact on, on some of these strategies. So when you're dealing with someone who's coming from afar, maybe a foreign language, and, and trying to deal with that trauma of relocation, et cetera, how, how do you use different strategies in that subpopulation? So I, I think that's a great point. Again, the original list of the ACEs I showed you, and obviously there's a whole set of adversity, right? So uh, I think a couple points I would just make there. Uh, whenever you talk about adversity, there's also the uh, mirror image of resilience. So the question then is how do we promote resilience? So uh, the, regardless of which list of the ACEs you use, the standard list, ACEs plus, urban ACEs, or what you were just talking about, you know, the, the stress that somebody might experience from essentially having you know, a fairly traumatic experience from going to, from one culture to another, and then who knows what all the circumstances. Um, the, the way that we know how to promote resilience is one, to recognize that the person probably had a difficult experience, but ask, and what does the experience mean to you? Uh, and not kind of boxing them in, because maybe they've already come to terms with it, and then you can just recognize that that's a pretty positive way to do that. Or maybe they haven't. But I think the first step is to recognize that they may have had a difficulty, and they may have had a difficulty that could have far-reaching consequences. So how are you making sense of that first? And then, you know, I'm a big person in terms of referring them on to someone who might be able to help them, whether that's a support group, a faith-based community, so, someone who can kind of have some of those longer conversations. But the one point I would just give you is, it is tremendously important for those of us in the room to understand how, how empowering it is for a, a patient's physician to say, yeah, that's something that I hear what you just said, and now I want you to work with it on, with this person. That kind of validation from a physician, because physicians have a very privileged position. They, uh, you know, I mean, physicians, uh, people, you know, might rail against the healthcare system, but they all love their physician. So I think you using that role to recognize that they've had some something that's traumatic, and then helping them see what the connection is. And that's where I think each of us has to kind of figure out in our own communities, who are your go-to people? So if you have a practice where there's a lot of immigrants, like who will you use? 
uh, because you have the patient's attention. Now the real win will be if you can get them over to someone who can help them with that problem. So I think we all have to kind of figure out who's in our community and who can we link with. Uh, we had a, 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 an experience uh, a couple years ago. We invited some of the behavioral health providers uh, over to the hospital to, uh, you know, to talk about some of this. And what was really amazing is a number of the behavioral health providers said, you know, this is the first time that I've ever been invited to come to the children's hospital. And I really feel honored to be here. And I would love to take the referrals that you want to send us. Uh, and what that told me was we, we as the physicians have to build some relationships with some of the other professionals we want to use and some of the other community groups that we want to use because they're really willing to work with us and they have a tremendous respect for our work. So uh, it's really almost like setting up those relationships so that you can send folks that have domestic violence to this person and substance abuse to that person and maybe immigrant experiences to this person. Uh, but I think that's going to be really important. But that's not um, a, kind of an easy thing to do. I, that's a very local meeting people and then kind of setting up those relationships. I want to thank you for the question. I was surprisingly struck by your question. Essentially what I heard was, so you're telling me to hold up this ACEs lens and you're holding up your clearly well-practiced cultural competence lens and how do you dial it in in order to care for this pop As the son of two immigrants, I was raised by a jackass authoritarian. I probably still have issues over that. Why, why, <laughs> why I find myself at lie. this table <laughs> and not running the streets, getting into trouble like this, you know, I mean, literally, mm -hmm. I have absolutely no idea why I tilted to resilience rather than despair. Um, it's one of the reasons, it's why resilience is one of my personal professional interests is because it is extraordinary when somebody is able to stand up after being knocked down. And it's not something that we give to patients. It's something that patients have to dig out for themselves. And we get the privilege of standing next to them to do that. And so uh, the, best, the best advice that I heard from Dr. Giordino was help them find their tribe and don't go anywhere. Just stand with them as they find their tribe and stand up themselves. One of the things that I might uh, chime in uh, with this that uh, has been real helpful to me that uh, a while back I heard a, uh, a gal who had had probably 15 or 20 psychiatric admissions and finally got her life turned around and uh, talked to us about how she did that. What I think we're talking about is she said, what made the difference for me is hope of how you instill hope and bring it forward. And I think one of the things that you heard in the previous presentations about Harvey and have mentioned here today, relationships and hope. So building in hope and how you have those sorts of conversations was what this person was saying, that was the recovery mechanism, that's how I got here. I had all these hospitalizations and eventually somebody helped me begin to see you can have hope and it changes the whole thing. Absolutely. Microphone four, I guess that would be the last question. I just wanted to ask a question. I'm an internal medicine physician in Sugarland, Elizabeth Torres, and I have a patient who's 58 years old. She came to see me because she needed sleep medication. She was seeing a pain management physician for chronic pain. So she says, I've had sleep issues all my life, and I, this is the only way I can sleep. I've tried every other drug there is. This is the only thing that will work for me. Um, so I'm stuck with what am I gonna do in this situation? So I referred her to the neurologist because she'd never seen one before, thinking maybe there's some reason that's a pain issue that's going on, She's, this is what's going on. Then it turned out that she was actually abused as a child, and this was, supposedly would set all this off. But uh, in this situation, she's been to, she's finally told us that she's been to multiple psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists. No one's been able to fix this issues. And so now I'm dealing with someone who has chronic pain medication, which probably doesn't need that, but they're on narcotics and a muscle relaxant that someone is giving them, which 
Uh, I'm, I'm trying to ferret that out, what's going on with that. But now I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do with this person who has obviously no faith in psychiatrists, psychologists, because they've not been able to help her. And she's on my doorstep, and I don't want to write sleep medications for the rest of her life. And I did explain that to her and her husband. But they call me because I have them on a two-week schedule, and I won't give them more than two weeks. So I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to undo this. And if you give me some guidelines or somewhere to start, uh, I can make this different. Find me after this, and I'll give you all of very specific guidance that probably doesn't benefit the, the room. But would anyone like to speak to the idea that here's a patient, you're beating your, health, your head against the wall, and there's this moment where you're able to identify a remote trauma, a remote adverse experience is likely driving this thing that I'm actually kind of surprised that you're not their fifth or sixth primary care doctor and that they haven't churned through eight or nine therapists yeah. and psychiatrists. And what are we doing when we allow people to live their life that way? Did, did you go, ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I mean, it sounds like you're doing an admirable job there in terms of you know taking her concerns seriously, getting her to the neurologist. I'm not sure I have any secret sauce other than I think kind of re remaining consistent with her that there, there is this hope and um, let's try to find the provider that can help you. I, 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 I'm probably, because I'm a pediatrician, I can kind of see exactly how she got set up for that and I, I kind of understand from a descriptive perspective how she kind of navigated through that and then kind of with her own psychiatric makeup kind of ended up latching onto pain meds. Uh, but it's not an easy job, so I wouldn't want to kind of say I have any kind of quick thing. One thing I think that uh, we sometimes forget about is how do you get to go see your doctor? You got to be sick. And sometimes the only way I can go and see my doctor is to have some sort of chronic illness. And sometimes the dialogue that can go on is a little bit different dialogue and trying to learn and find out what seems to make this better or worse and is there some other conversation we need to have? Because sometimes I think chronic pain may give me the only way to get to come and see my doctor. So sometimes, just like your patient earlier, it's what's the vehicle that will allow me to come and tell you what my day's like? Because there's not a lot of places where you can go and do that, but you can go and talk to your doctor. But if you got an illness, that's the ticket in the door. I'll tell you about a patient that I saw this last week that kind of fits into this. This is a, a patient that has been in, in and out of the hospital umpteen times and uh, one that gets labeled as a malinger. And so I went to see this patient uh, knowing that here's somebody that just drives us nuts. And um, he was on the trauma service. He um, had cocaine use disorder severe and had been back in again. And I... Uh, didn't ask him too much. I realized when I touched on the question of cocaine, got this awful frown. And uh, finally I said, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can do something a little bit different about your irritability. And let's try you on one of the anticonvulsants. So he said, okay. And I started him up on the anticonvulsant, went back the next day. Uh, how are you doing? You didn't do anything. All right, that sounds like we're making progress. So we increased it some more. About the third day, there was a different in tone with him. I said, how, how are we doing? You know, Doc, my irritability is awful. That was a big change for him to be able to say, my irritability is awful and I recognize it and I don't like to be there continue to try to help me, even though what you're doing doesn't seem to work worth a damn. But please continue to try to do something. I think that's what drives hope. 
and I think you could see it different with this man who was probably always labeled as a malinger, probably has some sort of bipolar type of disorder in that spectrum, but then how do we try to address it? And I think what we begin to see with neuroscience is we're a long way from finding those ways to address it in a chemical way, but certainly we can then be there to listen and go down that pathway with them and journey with them and try to bring some hope by just being there. Thanks. Any final questions? I want to thank you so much for your attention, and, uh, and I'd like to thank our distinguished speaker, Dr. Seacrest, for their insights and thoughts.